And we are live. Good evening, and thank you for being with us tonight. I'm Mitchell Kaplan of Books and Books in Miami, Florida. And tonight we're joining forces with our very own Miami Book Fair and two of our favorite independently owned bookstores, Harvard Bookstore in Cambridge, Mass, and Politics and Prose in Washington, DC, to present to you a virtual evening with Richard Powers in conversation with Elizabeth Colbert to discuss Richard's new novel, Bewilderment which is published today by our friends at W.W. Norton and Company. Richard Powers has published 13 novels. He's a MacArthur Fellow and he received the National Book Award as well. Bewilderment is a follow-up to Richard's Pulitzer Prize winning novel, The Overstory. This highly anticipated new novel, which as I said, today celebrates its kind of virtual book birthday has recently been shortlisted for the 2021 Booker Prize, and it's long listed for the National Book Award for Fiction, and it's no mystery why. And it's certainly no mystery to me. I read this book back in January and was stopped dead in my tracks. I immediately sent a note to the folks at Norton, people that I knew, and I said, this is what I had written to them. It was my first reaction upon reading Bewilderment, it's very dark time. Bewilderment moved me in a way that only the finest writing does these days. Brilliant, heartbreaking, cathartic. The ending took my breath away. Reading Bewilderment is in itself a kind of, quote, empathy machine, waking us up to what might be in store for us if we don't listen to what nature is trying to tell us. I can't wait to put this in the hands of everyone who walks through our doors or everyone who's listening to us on this virtual, this virtual event. Tonight, Richard's gonna to be joined in conversation with someone else who I, whom I admire extremely uh, uh, forcefully, and that's Elizabeth Colbert. She's an author, a journalist. Her book, The Sixth Extinction in Unnatural History is another one of those books that stopped me in my tracks, and it won the Pulitzer Prize. She's a staff writer at The New Yorker, and she's received two National Magazine Awards and the Blake Dodd Prize from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. Her newest book is Under a White Sky, The Nature of the Future. We will have some time to answer a few questions from all you guys uh, after their talk. So please remember to post your questions in the Q&A button that you'll find at the bottom of your screen. Um, and all of you tonight who are, who are coming to this event and have purchased a copy of Be Bewilderment, they will all be on their way to you first thing in the morning. And you're gonna have a huge treat if you haven't read this book already. And now it's my honor to bring Richard and Elizabeth up to the virtual stage. Hello, Elizabeth. Hello, Richard. Hi there. Hi, Mitchell. So I'm gonna I'm gonna dive in, uh, Rick um, and Mitchell, uh, and audience. Hi to everyone out there, wherever you are. Um, and I wanted to start because, as as Mitchell said, most people haven't even gotten the book yet, um, and I don't want to give it away to those who haven't read it because it's really full of surprises, but. It's obviously also important for this conversation to have a sense of what we're talking about. So I just wanted to ask you first, Rick, um, what you would like the audience to know about bewilderment. 
I before I start, I really have to uh, give some very effusive thanks uh, uh, to the three bookstores for hosting the event, but uh, especially to Mitchell Kaplan, whose enthusiasm for the book early on uh, was so encouraging to me during production. Uh, it's you never know what you're what you're making until the first few people who aren't uh, your mother and father or blood relations have a look at it. And it was just so encouraging to get Mitchell's enthusiasm for the book early on. And I also wanted to say before saying another word, how uh, thrilled and grateful I am that you agreed to do this event when they told me that I'd be talking to you. I felt great excitement um, having had conversations with you in my head for the better part of 15 years uh, and a little intimidation, um, but uh, it's, it's just such a pleasure to, to, to be on the other side of the screen with you, uh, perhaps uh, one day uh, across the table, but uh, thanks in the meantime for agreeing to do this. Oh, thank you, likewise, look back <laughs> at you as they say. So a, a quick summary, it's a bewilderment is uh, the story of two lost boys, I guess. Uh, uh, the uh, Theo Byrne, uh, a astrobiologist in his late thirties, uh, who is a single parent, his wife having died just a couple of years before the book begins, uh, who is trying to raise his intense, uh, and unusual nine-year-old son, Robin. Uh, and uh, admittedly at a bit of a loss as to how to handle the kinds of, of crises that Robin has gotten himself into just before the beginning of the book, uh, in, involving uh, trouble at school, violence with his uh, uh, fellow school children and uh, increasing agitation, anger, uh, distress. Robin is a child who has a great capacity to love, a great capacity to feel joy and to throw himself intensely uh, into uh, all kinds of projects. But he is a boy who is suffering deeply from trauma, both personal and more general. So to, to give people sort of a sense of the voice of the book and of the characters, um, we had talked about you know, reading a couple sections that I wanted to, and, and I guess I'm not sure you call them chapters. That's an interesting question because the book has a very interesting structure. Um, but the first one was the, the chapter starting on page four, the passage starting on page four. And then the second one was starting on page 14. They're very different, but I think that would give people sort of a, a little bit of a sense of things. Sure. Uh, the, the, the first uh, passage to ask for is great because it, it does establish uh, Theo's central crisis at the beginning of the book with regard to taking care of his son. This book is in many ways a, a, a love story for a father, for a, a son who he would do anything in his power uh, to, to protect from the world, but he does not know what that is. And it doesn't extend to lying to the boy when the boy demands answers uh, about uh, uh, the, the discoveries that he's making uh, at the age of nine uh, with regard to the adult world. So I'm gonna read this little introduction uh, which, which treats Theo's ambivalence, his struggle, his uh, uncertainty with regard to how to move forward with uh, his attempts to take care of his son. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to have to do this in, in very mellow lighting of a hotel room in Knoxville where I've come because uh, my home in the Smokies doesn't have sufficient bandwidth for Zoom. Uh, and this is, believe it or not, as high as I can bring the lights. Um, I never believed the diagnoses the doctors settled on my son. When a condition gets three different names over as many decades, when it requires two subcategories to account for completely different symptoms, when it goes from non-existent to the country's most commonly diagnosed childhood disorder in the course of one generation, when two different physicians want to prescribe three different medications, there's something wrong. My Robin didn't always sleep well. 
He wet the bed a few times a season and it hunched him over with shame. Noises unsettled him. He liked to turn the sound way down on the television, too low for me to hear. He hated when the cloth monkey wasn't on its perch in the laundry room above the washing machine. He poured every dollar of allowance into a trading card game, collect them all, but he kept the untouched cards in numeric order in plastic sleeves in a special binder. He could smell a fart from across a crowded movie theater. He'd focus for hours on minerals of Nevada or the kings and queens of England anything in tables. He sketched constantly and well, laboring over fine details lost on me, intricate buildings and machines for a year, then animals and plants. His pronouncements were off the wall mysteries to everyone except me. He could quote whole scenes from movies even after a single viewing. He rehearsed memories endlessly and every repetition of the details made him happier. When he finished a book he liked, he'd start it again immediately from page one. He melted down and exploded over nothing. But he could just as easily be overcome by joy. On rough nights when Robin retreated to my bed, he wanted to be on the side farthest from the endless terrors outside the window. His mother had always wanted the safe side too. He daydreamed, had trouble with deadlines, and yes, he refused to focus on things that didn't interest him. But he never fidgeted or dashed around or talked without stopping, and he could hold still for hours with things he loved. Tell me what deficit matched up with all that. What disorder explained him? The suggestions were plentiful, including syndromes linked to the billion pounds of toxins sprayed on the country's food supply each year. His second pediatrician was keen to put Robin on the spectrum. I wanted to tell the man that everyone alive on this fluke little planet was on the spectrum. That's what a spectrum is. I wanted to tell the man that life itself is a spectrum disorder where each of us vibrated at some unique frequency in the continuous rainbow. Then I wanted to punch him. I suppose there's a name for that too. Oddly enough, there's no name in the DSM for the compulsion to diagnose people. When his school suspended Robin for two days and put their own doctors on the case, I felt like the last reactionary throwback. What was there to explain? Synthetic clothing gave him hideous eczema. His classmates harassed him for not understanding their vicious, vicious gossip. His mother was crushed to death when he was seven. His beloved dog died of confusion a few months later. What more reason for disturbed behavior did any doctor need? Watching medicine fail my child, I developed a crackpot theory. Life is something we need to stop correcting. My boy was a pocket universe I could never hope to fathom. Every one of us is an experiment and we don't even know what the experiment is testing. My wife would have known how to talk to the doctors. Nobody's perfect, she liked to say, but man, we all fall short so beautifully. So that's Robin and Theo in a nutshell. And uh, uh, his decisions uh, that he explains in this short passage um, are, are never entirely comfortable with him or with the people around him. And much of the story I think does hinge upon you know, whether or not he's taking the right steps forward. I mean, he confesses to not knowing how to be a good parent. And in this question, as well as in so many others, he's improvising, he's doing the best he can under fire uh, in real time. And I think that much of what's set up in this, in this initial uh, 
pushback against uh, the diagnosis does uh, both propel the plot forward and lead to some consequences later on in the story. So our, our narrator, Theo, whose you know, voice that passage is in is, as, as you mentioned, I think, an astrobiologist, um, which is a fascinating um, profession to say the least. And I, I want to ask you, you know, I read a review by an actual astrobiologist who um, said you really got this science spot on. And I, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the decision to cast him in that profession and, and what sort of research you had to do to, to create a, a believable astrobiologist. Yeah, I, I also saw that, that review recently in Nautilus and was greatly relieved that some of the <laughs> credentials uh, vetted my research for that. Uh, you know, again, you, know, you, uh, you throw yourself into a field as an outsider uh, and especially one as diverse as astrobiology and, and uh, talk to who you can and read who you can, uh, but you live or die by your own fictional extensions of, of you know, that imaginative space. So that was a great relief to me. Astrobiology is a field, you know, it's, it's so young and, and it's so rapidly growing. It's, it's a field that wasn't even really a thing when I was Theo's age. Uh, and it's, it's come on uh, in the last couple of years explosively in part because of the, the huge increase in our uh, ability to detect and, and study exoplanets. Uh, but also, uh, you know, it, it is a discipline that looks backward to earth as well. And new discoveries about the potential of life on earth in the last few decades has really changed our sense of you know what this what this force does and what it can do and where it can do it and you know we're asking old questions in new ways uh, we're, we're drawing on new evidence to answer uh, but the, the the outward look that Theo is casting he's he's involved in making models that will uh, be useful when we begin to study in depth the spectroscopy of planetary ex exoplanetary atmospheres. All of his outward gaze at the question of what is life, uh, how ubiquitous is it, are we alone here, is it everywhere, what can it possibly do in these other planets, that becomes part of his and Robin's story as well. Uh, Robin, is like a lot of children, a kind of pantheist uh, or, or um, animist. You know, he he sees the sacred everywhere, uh, as um, as a lot of children do. Uh, he is absolutely absolutely convinced of um, the agency and intelligence and and. Uh, uh, sacredness in the non, in the more than human world. And he's, he's fascinated with his father's questions insofar as they reflect backwards uh, on this planet. Um, and it happens that one of the very few things that managed to calm Robin and to give him a sense to lessen his eco trauma, uh, to lessen his, his, sense of catastrophic doom that uh, has come about by his discovery of the, the, the mass die off that we're living in the middle of is when his father takes him in place of bedtime stories to other planets, planets that are based on the, the scientific discipline uh, uh, that Theo studies during the day, but are also highly reflective of the emotional states uh, that Theo and Robin themselves are in uh, at any given point in the story. Their own hopes and fears and dreams are reflected by these voyages that the two of them are taking around the universe. Um, so Theo's would be, those, those stories are wonderful. And I don't know if you want to read one of those, Rick, or, or let readers read them themselves. Um, but I'll, I'll pose one more question here in the, in, sure. in the, in the meantime and say that He's a big science sci-fi devotee. I mean, mm -hmm. he, he, a lot of his references are from sci-fi and 
you know, while bewilderment is obviously not a work of sci-fi, at least in my view, um, you know, it's obviously playing around with, with sci-fi. Um, and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about your, your own relationship to sci-fi um, in your own reading life. Yeah, um, I, I would say I, I, I do agree with you that bewilderment does not read like science fiction. It reads like a domestic realist novel, aside from these excursions that father and son are making together. And yet the plot does uh, integrate into a, 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 an experiment that pushes existing technologies just beyond their current threshold into this space where the reader is going to have a little bit of uncertainty and instability as to whether this could happen or not, whether it could happen this year or five years from now or 10 years from now. So I am playing a little bit with that science fiction genre of the near term future. Um, that you know that those books that are set in a world very much like ours uh, at some designate moment in the future that allows for just some small tweak or change uh, in existing technologies that, you know, that uh, open up the possibility of thinking of society and its challenges in different ways. I would, I would call this book actually a, a near present uh, uh, novel in that the, 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 the world that is being uh, that is intruding onto the story of the father and the son will be recognizable to readers who have lived through the last three or four years of this world, but it will also be estranging. It will be surprising. It, it, it's, a, it's a slight tangent to the world that we're living on. It's recognizable, but different. And again, uh, to keep that estrangement effect, to, to keep that sense of traveling to other planets, I think what I was trying to induce in the reader was this sense of traveling to a parallel earth, you know, uh, in the way that say the old Star Trek uh, kinds of series might do where the things, the, 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 the world visited um, is seen from some other perspective than inside the, the known present. Uh, my own relationship to sci-fi it's a long and winding road. Mm -hmm. When I when I was Robin's age, I adored it, and I I loved putting into the book some of the book some of the texts that were so uh, formative to me as I was uh, going into uh, adolescence and and my teenage years, um, and I was coming of age at the moment of this great. Uh, renaissance in uh, planetary romances, you know, people writing uh, in in the uh, late 60s and early 70s and using the planet as a way to uh, to do sociology or to do uh, futurism or to do uh, other kinds of ethnography, to re-examine uh, the collisions that we've experienced here, you know, again, from the outside. When I started uh, getting serious about literature as a possible life pursuit. I hate to say it, but I made a mistake that a lot of people of my age who were interested in literary fiction made, which was to say, well, when I was a child, I thought of a child, uh, thought like a child, and you know, and I'm going to put away those childish things and now start looking at real literature. And it, it was a colossal mistake in a waste. I mean, the, they, the great practitioners, of course, always crossed over and, and we could, you know, we, we could see uh, people who were identified as belonging to that sub-literary genre of science fiction who could excel on literary fiction's own terms. But we were blind to the fact that there that these books were doing something hugely different and hugely important and simply because they didn't, they weren't as interested as literary fiction traditionally is in these questions of psychological ambivalence and character robustness and you know, moral 
uh, you know, the, the big sort of moral dialogical battles that literary fiction revels in, that they were that they were doing something crude, and that's not at all the case. And I think, uh, having come back to science fiction uh, now in my late fifties and early sixties, I regret uh, the time away, and I also see. Uh, and, and, and really cheer the way that that, that entire field has been uh, rehabilitated, folded back into the most serious kinds of literary pursuit. Uh, and that the, the that hardcore belletristic literary authors are now reveling in what they can learn from, from this uh, long denied uh, blood relation. So let me ask you a question about um, our other protagonist, who is is Robin, the boy um, whom we heard about in the passage that you read. And you know, he's a he's a kid who um, seems to other people, in, including his father, in a certain sense, even though he you know rejects the, these various diagnoses. But he does seem disturbed in some way. He doesn't seem like a normal kid. And he's also a kid who does who possesses a kind of, of radical empathy. And the suggestion of the book um, is that those two qualities you know, are related. And I'm wondering if, if you can talk about that a little bit. The relation between a child who feels so deeply, so, so ready channels of empathy and uh, um, a child who is quick to Doesn't lose self possession on the yeah. schoolyard. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And again, um, Robin's falling outside of maybe the the, the the mode of the normal distribution curve. Um, can be interpreted in different ways. It's also, I, I think. Um, it was my way of creating a character who suffered very intensely from the kinds of things that even the most normative children are suffering from now. Um, the, this relationship between the ability to feel and take seriously not only people very, unlike you, but the more than human world is, is at the heart of this book. It really you know, is deeply implicated into the theme of the book. But the question of how to sustain that and nurture it in a culture that has brought to the extreme the idea of human exceptionalism, uh, individualism, commodity mediated meeting, meaning uh, competition as um, the, 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 the great and pathway to success. Um, that, th that culture is in, incompatible with uh, the kind of intense ability to, to feel and suffer that Robin has. Uh, and uh, oddly the book turns back on this question of how to give the boy solace. And, and Theo enters him into a strange kind of uh, experimental procedure that allows him to train his own neural patterns in real time on a target pattern that has been recorded uh, from other human beings. And it's this gradual ability to, to, to open up that locked room and to, you know, to, um, to feel a kind of self-possession in uh, reciprocal recognition that again, propels the story into, into down its plot line and, and toward its climax. Uh, I think also about this question with regard to heightening empathy and yet surviving a culture that is the antithesis of empathetic with regard to how to create a novel 
that treats the cataclysms that we've unleashed on this world? Is it possible to tell a narrative story that can, that can raise a reader's empathy for this troubled child and ask that reader to watch this child go through hell without turning that reader off, without, without making this seem too overwhelming or too dark or too despairing to, to come away from in a useful and productive way. And it, you know, I wonder if this is also the case with your nonfiction. You have to find a way to do what Thomas Hardy calls taking a full look at the worst. And yet you can't let the facts annihilate your commitment to continue to engage the future. So, I, you know, I, I thought it might be an interesting opportunity to ask you how you balance this question of hope and how much you can give the reader and how, you know, that, that battle between hope and truth. Yeah, that's a good, that's a really good way of putting it. Um, I, I don't have a, a, a great answer for that. I mean, I, I don't know how, you know, I feel like my obligation is to the truth as a journalist as, and you know, the, the grimmer things get in a way, the higher the obligation, I suppose. Mm -hmm. But as you say, if no one reads the piece or they, you know, drop it after the first. So I am always looking for, you know, I rely a lot, you know, as, as I'm inferring you do on, on the story, the story has to be, you know, compelling enough that you want to read it, even though there's a, um, you know, through line of dread, I suppose. And I, it has to be, uh, once again, you know, I, I'm, once I'm sort of projecting here maybe, but, but, you know, there have to be surprises. There have to be, can't just be like, you know, I hit you over the head with what, unfortunately, and this probably goes for a lot of your readers as well, though not as many of them, but my readers, you know, they kind of know what's coming. So you have to kind of yeah. <laughs> keep them a little bit off guard. Right. But that actually does kind of lead me to my next question, because I really wanted to ask you about, you know, is there something that novels and novelists can accomplish in, you know, what I will sort of blandly call, you know, environmental awareness that other ways of communicating, for example, nonfiction, you know, really can't do? Do they have, you know, a sort of superpower? And related to that is this question of whether novelists have a particular responsibility then, you know, if that is the case. Yeah, and, and um, the question of artistic responsibility and the question of artistic technique have to be asked again and again and reinvented uh, ev every time out. Um, there was a line in my previous novel, Overstory, uh, all, all the facts and our good arguments in the world can't change a person's mind. The only thing that can do that is a good story. And I think that's a byproduct of the way that our, our consciousness is structured. You know, we, we've evolved with this hugely adaptive capacity for narrative extrapolation. You know, um, it, it's part and parcel of all the power that consciousness has to be able to simulate, to imagine, and then to extrapolate and to say, well, what happens next? What happens next? And, and to, to follow a narrative and to be compelled by a narrative and to have that strange relationship of beginning, middle, and end constantly change as you're following a story is to be inside a kind of empathy machine like the decoded neurofeedback that I was just describing. When, when I, as a reader, say, oh my God, I want to stop that person from doing what they're about to do. Or, you know, let me just put my ar arms around them for a second. Or any of these other kinds of weird emotional attachments that we make to characters inside a narrative. It's actually changing the perspective that I'm taking on my own world. And it's, it, it, you know, psychologists have, have 
produced a number of intriguing experiments that show simply asking a person to play act or maintain or, or imagine or pretend a perspective that isn't theirs makes them more uh, pliant. It makes them more capable of do, doing this kind of humble, empathetic leap that we are all gonna need if we wanna stick around here much longer. You know, the, to get out of our own sense of, of committed narrative, to get out of our own sense of organizing the world in terms of our, our friends that are, and our enemies or you know, those who I need to pay attention to or those who I don't, all of those require story to, to move a person around to. Luckily, in, you know, with, back with this question of truth versus hope and darkness, you know, how, how much can you afford to bring a reader into cataclysm in order for that story to take hold? There is a flip side to narrative too, which is, you know, what Aristotle called catharsis, that you can actually experience horrific things on the page and feel overwhelmed by them. And that actually in a, in a kind of uh, inoculatory way produces a capacity to reassert your sense of, of meaning and purpose once that darkness on the page ends. And that it's, it's a delicate balance too, but the, the the relationship between dark and light inside a story is a complex one, and its effects on a reader are very, very volatile. And of course, every book intersects the reader's own private narratives and makes those patches of darkness or lightness palatable or impalatable in ways that the author can't control. But it is possible to change the way that a character inhabits, a, a reader inhabits his or her own life by changing the, the sympathies that they might have for a person in a story that would be very different than the, the ones they might extend to a real such person, you know, in, in the room next to theirs. Yeah, yeah. Well, that, that does raise another question that I was, was on my list, which is, you know, the, this technology that's in the book, which is maybe many years in the future, maybe in the near future, you know, is clearly sort of a, you know, figure for the novel that's experience of entering another person's mind. And it made me wonder, um, made me want to ask you about sort of the future of the novel in a, in a time, in a tech, very fast changing technological world where, you know, we're, I don't, I don't want to say this as a book thing, but where books themselves seem to be, you know, further down our list of technological ways that we interact with the world. Oh yeah, it's a it's a rich and complex question. Well, let's you know, let's put Mitchell on the spot when he comes back because <laughs> he's he's so much better read than I am. But I I personally believe that the novel is in a period of renaissance. Uh, that there is a huge amount that's being done all over the place. And again, partly because we, you know, the, the, the canonical literary people have become aware of, of how big the tent really is and, you know, how, you know, how the, 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 the little vein that we've been mining for a long time uh, actually is reciprocally interdependent with all kinds of other projects. But uh, voices uh, from marginalized and un underrepresented uh, cultures and uh, uh, great exploration of, of uh, gender diversity, um, a playfulness has come back into the form, you know, uh, 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 that uh, uh, irreverence and also huge amounts of new kinds of language uh, are also exploding all over the place. Uh, and, you know, my plea is among all of this, you know, great rediscovery of this arsenal in this loose, loose genre called the novel, which basically means anything that's not poetry and that's not nonfiction, you know, um, that, that, 
eclecticism and the adventurousness and the playfulness that, that we're, that we're uh, experiencing now, that that somehow my, my plea is to turn that back outwards onto the non-human, the more than human world and to tell stories the way that indigenous cultures would invariably tell them where we would only be one of many agents inside a complex web of, of interrelations. I just, you know, I think the changing consciousness that we need in order for the future to stop seeing paralytically terrifying and to start seeming like it can still be engaged in a meaningful way, in a way that might even be more meaningful than the way we've been engaging the world up until now, it's, it's going to require a, a, re, a, a, a reintegration of the non-human, the more than human, as central, as characters and as agents and as situations and settings. If, if we're to give up our human exceptionalism and come back and live on earth, not as, as uh, you describe it under a white sky, simply as attempting to throw one technological solution after another technological solution and one paradigm of mastery after another paradigm of mastery. If we are instead to say, no, we live here, we actually live here among the neighbors as a co-responsible, interrelated and you know, reciprocally connected uh, entity in a huge web, we're going to need stories that look like that too. We're going to need the novel to follow, you know, to 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 light that path. Okay, I'm going to ask one more question. I know there's a lot of questions from the audience. They're going to hand it back to Mitch in one second. Um, so here's my last question to you, Rick. So in, you know, the book brings together um, these you know, looking for or imagining life on other planets and, and the destruction of life on this planet. And I, I've always personally felt that there's a kind of a tension here between, you know, why are we worrying about life on other planets when there's so much right here on planet Earth that we don't know and that we're, you know, obliterating um, without even thinking about it. And I wonder if you feel that there's a tension there and if if that's why you brought these together, or do you do you see them as more maybe more harmonious than I do? Well, it's a, it's a it's a very um, crucial and highly multivalent question. Let me start by saying Theo's field, astrobiology, is is not just asking is there life out there, but what is life? What is it capable of? What does it want? How, how does it get started? How rare is it that it gets started? Uh, how, you know, how, what, what are the bottlenecks uh, between, say, the simple cell and the first compound cell or the, the compound cell and a multicellular organism or between a multicellular organism and, uh, and, and one that has, you know, rudimentary consciousness? All of these questions are part of the field of astrobiology. So to point our eyes outward and to ask, you know, where can life exist and under what conditions and what would it look like is not to turn our eyes away from the earth. So in, in the biggest lens, the questions that his field asks have been fundamental human questions from the beginning. They're almost religious sized questions. In fact, what, why, why even qualify that and say almost? The question for Theo is the question that you know, uh, Bronze Age people were asking when they looked up at the sky. Uh, are we, do we need a sponsor? How much attention does that sponsor have to pay to us? You know, uh, are, are we special or are we commonplace? But, uh, the answers to those questions actually do change the way that we think about ourselves. And if, the, if you say the great question remaining to the study of, of, of the possibility of life elsewhere can be answered in one of two ways, right? If, if you concede that um, the, the universe 
being three times older than the Earth, with a hundred billion galaxies at minimum, and a hundred billion stars in each of those galaxies, and each of those stars that we now know probably we has at least one planet and we're expanding all the time what we think of as the habitable zone. We still have this horrific, massive question in front of us, which is the Fermi paradox. Where is everybody? Now, there's two possible answers to where is everybody. And the one is they're all over the place. And we will eventually find that evidence as we get better and more capable. And the other is Sorry, this is it, you know. Now, let's say the instruments keep getting stronger and stronger and better and better, and we keep, you know, we, we keep casting our eyes outwards and asking that question, and there's still nothing but the great silence, and we don't even see an, any evidence of microbial life in, you know, planets elsewhere. What would that do to our sense of stewardship here? If we were to, if we were really to have to stare down the possibility that it only happened once and here we are. I, you know, I, I think that raises the stakes in some, you know, in, in, in a way it's a, again, it would change our sense. It, it would change our beliefs because we would have a different story handed to us, right? If on the other hand, tomorrow we open the New York Times and somebody has found a biosignature on an exoplanet and it's now quite clear if they found it so easily and so nearby uh, after such a short period of time of looking that life is everywhere in the universe. It's ubiquitous, it's almost a byproduct of physical law. That would also change our story about who we are. And it would, it would break us to some extent of this habit of human exceptionalism of thinking that somehow, you know, God came and gave us this uh, uh, amazing thing, and uh, you know, and and we should have dominion over the earth and all the creatures of the earth. No, I mean, if if life were everywhere, it would be humbling, and it would force us to think about ourselves differently too. You know, that all of this planetary searching in the book, Father and the Son traveling to these different places, as the Son is desperately trying to figure out how to live here on Earth. You know, come by the end of the book, they, they circle back onto the earth. And there's this belated realization on the part of both Theo and Robin that actually the aliens are everywhere and they're all around us. And we just have to get better at holding still and being present and attending to that and taking them seriously. Well, thank you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I know that people are, other people are clamoring to ask questions so they can see in the Q&A. So I'm going to hand things over to Mitchell to, um, to do that. Well, this, this, <clears throat> this is amazing. And I think Elizabeth and Rick, you both ans helped answer the question of the power of books and the power of story and the power of discussion. So I can't thank you enough, Elizabeth, for conducting this really remarkable interview with Rick and the generosity with, with which you answered the questions, Rick. Um, I'm, I'm standing, this is the book <laughs> for all of you who don't <laughs> see it. It's an amazing book. But you know, I'm really glad, Rick, the question that I have is you really talked about empathy and catharsis. And, you know, in many ways, that's kind of why I read fiction. And you asked Elizabeth about you know, why, why story, why books in this, in this technological time that we're living through. And all that I have to say is that, you know, the kind of empathy and catharsis that one finds in a novel is so much better than Instagram. You know, it's so much better than what you find online in Twitter feeds. And to be able to live with characters like we lived with Rick's characters um, and the catharsis that one gets by reading all of this uh, is something that makes us, you know, far more um, understanding of not only the world around us, but other people. And it brings me, Rick, to the question about, it's funny because one of the first books that I really remember as a kid reading that brought me to this place was Flowers for Algernon, 
right? Mm -hmm. So talk about the importance of flowers for Algernon as it relates to bewilderment. When I first read about the decoded neurofeedback technology that Elizabeth and I were talking about, it was back in 2013. Uh, the technology itself dates back about 10 years, still in its infancy. It's being used today mostly as a treatment of, of trauma, um, but there's a great deal of research going into it. And as, as the machines that support it improve, it will also improve. But even reading about it back in 2013, I thought, holy cow, this is, you know, a person who went through this could actually train their emotional intelligence. And they could, in a shorter period of time, perhaps, you know, in, in this imaginative story that I was telling myself, they could, they could do the things that require years of being knocked around in the world, uh, you know, uh, uh, create. And, and they, could, uh, they could rapidly go up the scale of emotional intelligence. And I was just thinking that I thought, wait a minute, that sounds like a story that I read when I was a kid. And of course, Flowers for Algernon is uh, the story about someone who has a sort of science fiction intervention and increases their cognitive ability. Their, their what, we, what we would call their intelligence, just their, their core intelligence. Uh, and then of course has to lose it again. And, and I just, I, I, I went back to look at the story and I saw it's, uh, that, that Keyes uses as his uh, epigraph, a line from Plato's uh, cave, the allegory of the cave in Plato's Republic. And the, the line is uh, that, that the mind, like the eye, knows two kinds of, of, of bewilderment, but going into the light and coming out of it. And of course, in Plato's cave, you know, we're all sort of chained uh, to, you know, watching this shadow show and taking the shadow show for the real thing. And one of us breaks the chains off, goes outside and realizes, you know, the, the error of this, uh, you know, this trap and comes back in and tries to tell the others, actually, there's a real world out there and that doesn't go so well. But uh, uh, the, the point being that Keyes' story was a retelling of Plato's cave in that it's, you know, it's emerging from some sense of what life is going into another and then having to come back. And, and I thought that, that uh, my book would also be a kind of retelling of Plato's cave. And, you know, the, the, the interesting thing from the, the, the narratological point of view on this book is that the entire book is narrated by the father. We never have access to what's actually happening to Robin. And to some extent, Theo's strange and intense child is always a locked room to him. But he watches his son leave the cave and, and then go back in. And that's where I think the catharsis of the book comes in for Theo and then for us as readers. You know, that the, 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 the bewilderment of the mind is when things become suddenly bright and then once again, when they become suddenly dark, but that's, that is precisely the process of, of leaving and returning that narrative allows us, uh, you know, with regard to our own lives. Well, thank you for that answer. That was great. Um, I'll go to the questions and you just need to know that you have, um, you have folks from Evanston, Evanston in the house. And my, so my, my, uh, we will fight for you. I guess <laughs> Evanston is the high school, ETHS is the Evanston High School that you went to, right? I, I actually uh, went to high school uh, abroad. I had left um, in Northern Illinois by the time I was in high school. So um, yeah, and then I came back and finished high school in DeKalb, Illinois, but I was born in Evanston. So it's lovely to have well, They are, that high school is um, claiming you as theirs. I am, I'm willing to <laughs> sign on. Yeah. Um, Someone's asking, and if and I would love to hear it too, would you would you be happy? Would you be able to read one of the planet stories? Do you think? Oh sure. In, in fact, Elizabeth had, had wanted me to. <laughs> um, 
and she, she had selected one of the early ones. Um, and, and maybe in light of the conversation that we had, it will be clear why she made this choice. It's about a page and a half. So is that, is that okay? About That's maybe four fine. minutes of reading? Yeah. Okay. I, it's disconcerting. This is, you know, I, I, I live in the Smoky Mountains and don't have the bandwidth for teleconferencing. So unlike the rest of North America, I haven't lived through a year and a half of Zoom sessions. So I'm doing this and thinking, are they laughing? Are they groaning? Is, is this a good thing? And I'm having no cues at all. It's quite, quite wonderfully uh, disconcerting. So this is Theo uh, um, on one of the planetary excursions that he's taking Robin on. I took him to the planet Tavao about the size and warmth. It had mountains and plains and surface water, a thick atmosphere with clouds, wind, and rain. Rivers wore the rocks into great channels that ran the sediment down to rolling seas. My son jittered, taking it in. It looks like here, Dad. It, it looks like Earth, a little. What's different? The answer wasn't obvious on the reddish rocky coast where we stood. We turned and looked. Across the entire landscape, nothing grew. It's dead. Not dead. Try your microscope. He knelt and scooped some film from a tidal pool onto a slide. Creatures everywhere. Spirals and rods. Footballs and filaments ribbed, poured, or lined with flagella. He could have taken forever just sketching all the kinds. Oh, you mean it's just young? It's just getting started. It's three times older than the earth. He looked around the blighted landscape. Then what's wrong? For my boy, Large creatures wandering everywhere were a God-given right. I told him Deval was almost perfect. The right place in the right kind of galaxy, with the right metallicity and low risk of annihilation from radiation or other fatal disturbances. It revolved at the right distance around the right kind of star. Like Earth, it had floating plates and volcanoes in a strong magnetic field, which made for stable carbon cycles and steady temperatures. Like Earth, it was showered with water from comets. Holy crow, Dad, how many things did Earth need? More than a planet deserves. He snapped his fingers, but they were too rubbery and small to make a sound. Got it, meteors. But Deval, like Earth, had large planets in the farther orbit, shielding it from extreme bombardment. Then what's wrong? He seemed about to cry. No large moon, nothing nearby to stabilize its spin. We lifted into near orbit and the world wobbled. We watched as the days changed chaotically and April blinked into December then August, then May. We watched for millions of years. Microbes bumped up against their limits like a float thumping a dock. Every time life tried to break loose, the planet twirled, beating it back down to extremophiles. Forever? Until a solar flare burns away its atmosphere. His face made me kick myself for telling him this one too soon. It's cool, he said, faking bravery, kind of. Deval ran barren all the way to the horizon. He shook his head, trying to decide whether the place was a tragedy or a triumph. He looked at me. When he spoke, it was the first question of life everywhere in the universe. What else, Dad? Where else? Hmm. Show me another one. Hmm. So beautiful. Elizabeth, you, you chose that for Rick to read. Is there something 
that you can reflect upon with that or are you, are you just caught up with it the way we all are? <laughs> well, I think it, it was, um, it, it does raise the most profound questions about life, as Rick says, you know, is this, is, is, is that it? And, and why is one form of life better than another form of life? So I think it's really um, deep <laughs> as that runs, runs. But they're all of those passages I thought were great. They were beautiful. You know, it occurs to me that it actually provides a, a, a slightly, a, a more indirect, but a slightly better answer to, to Elizabeth's question earlier about, you know, is, is astrobiology a luxury when we're facing this crisis right here? And if astrobiology succeeds in telling us that we actually need thousands of things to make Earth habitable and thousands of things interacting in the right way, it increases our sense of, of luckiness. And to, I, I, you know, I, I think it, 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 can, it can compel a kind of stewardship that taking the place for granted, you know, doesn't require. You know, you, you talked to, uh, Rick, you talked about before the kind of book, or the kind of, of, of writing in which it's not human centric in a sense that that could create a new kind of empathy, a new kind of catharsis. Are there, are there people writing? Someone's asking about authors that you feel aren't well enough known. Mm, Is there yeah. someone writing now that you would recommend who's doing that sort of thing? Well, uh, again, I wouldn't say that uh, I'm necessarily calling for fiction that isn't human centric. I think that'd be tough for most of us. I think we're, we're gonna have to be at the center of our own stories, but it's gonna be, a, 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 a circle that is much more inclusive. That's what I'm calling for. Maybe not quite so much uh, exclusive, you know, uh, uh, human exclusivity, but to weave us into, you know, broader patterns of interbeing. And I, I think that actually the science fiction people never stop doing that. And then, you know, there are interesting crossover uh, uh, writers who have one foot in the science, science fiction world and one foot in the literary world, uh, like Karen Joy Fowler, I'll be doing an event with her later in the week, uh, you know, who, whose uh, book, uh, We Are All Completely Beside Ourselves, actually places uh, human characters alongside, uh, uh, well, I don't want to give I don't want to give anything away about that book either, but uh, that's, a, that's a book that, that, that truly takes on this question of can we tell stories about ourselves without telling how closely we, we, we are related to the nearest neighbors? Who are some of the sci-fi writers that you read that when you, were, when you were reading either as a kid or now, who are some of the science fiction writers that you admired? I, I certainly you know, read uh, the classics uh, the Asimovs and the Arthur C. Clarks and you know e e e the Herberts and the you know uh, even the Robert Heinleins, um, but oh, I started opening up. You know, the, um, it, it it was it, it was people like Ursula Le Guin and another woman writer, uh, James Tiptree Jr. Uh, that was her pseudonym. And what an amazing story uh, her life is. Um, you can you can uh, hunt down a biography of her. Uh, I think it's called the the double life of James Tiptree Jr. Right. Um, and you know the 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 um, the the use of science fiction to just sort of blow open cultural normativity was so much more interesting to me than the the kind of um, hardware based science fiction uh, that was, you know, the, 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 the generation that I was coming out of, I think, uh, in, the, in the 60s. Elizabeth, for you, are there, are there authors that you feel, you know, aren't getting uh, enough attention, people that you admire? Well, I think there were a, a bunch of books this year that I was um, Sad didn't get more attention. Um, there's a book, Wild Souls by Emma Maris. These are all nonfiction books, I'm going to have to um, confess. Uh, 
Beloved Beasts um, by M Michelle no Noeha Hus. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Anyway, I think there are a lot of books about environmental books that came out this past year that for whatever reason just didn't, you know, it's so hard to, we live in such an world where everything's clamoring for attention. It's really hard to break through, but those, those are two books that come to mind that I thought didn't get enough attention in just in the past year. There's a book that I, I read and I liked that fits some of what you're talking about, I think, Rick, and that's Fox and I by this woman, Catherine Raven. I don't know if either of you have read that. I um, haven't read it. It, it, it. That got a fair amount of press, but I haven't read it yet. Yeah, it's a memoir where she puts basically the fox at the center of things in her, in her memoir. Really interesting as well. Um, there, there are so many questions. We could, we could go on forever, but... Um, I guess we can probably, we'll ask a couple more, but Rick, Rick, you said you're not really sure how people are responding. I can tell you <laughs> that from the texts I'm getting and from the, looking at the chat, it's Bravo after Bravo after Bravo. <laughs> so you should feel really, really good about that. That's reassuring. Um, That's reassuring. um let's see. Here's not a question, just to say, I'm so glad you are promoting the interdependence of all life contrasted with human exceptionalism, paradigm of separation. I can't wait to read this book. Um, and I, I guess we can end with a, with, with a question, which I think, you know, could be really, you know, for anybody writing. And that is the question that someone's asking is, where did these did they come from something in your own life story? Um, where exactly did they come from? I'm sorry, but there was a, a signal drop right at the crucial point of this question. <laughs> where did where did these characters come from? Yeah. Did they potentially come from a place in your own life? That sort of thing. I started writing a book that was similar to this book using very different characters in a very different world and a very different kind of voice. Um, and it wasn't working. And it wasn't working in part because I was still traveling a lot for Overstory, both here and abroad. And it's tough, as you know, I'm sure Elizabeth can say, just having come, come off touring for uh, Under a White Sky, um, it's tough to concentrate on the next project when you're still being asked to, to represent the previous one. So I only had bits and pieces of time with which to toy with the story, but I could tell that there, there something, you know, something about my approach to it wasn't working. And when, when I get stymied these days, I, I don't get anxious anymore. I just go out, you know, and I'm, I'm, one of the luckiest people alive in that I have this half a million acres of, of uh, both primary forest and recovering wilderness in my backyard. And I can step out the door of the house and be on a trail. And I was on a trail uh, maybe three or four miles down, uh, hadn't seen a human being in a while. And I had this odd sense of, uh, you know, I had this momentary fleeting impression of, of a little kid riding on my shoulders. The way that you'll sometimes see when you when you walk in the in the you know the parent has to take the kid and put him on his shoulders because the kid can't walk any farther, and and then I imagined this this boy on my shoulders. I just imagined him down by my side, and and he was gone almost right away. It was just this odd floating sense of a a, a, a young kid who was just in rapture over being on that trail. And his head, you know, creating whiplash. I was, I was looking around at the, at the, at the plants and and invertebrates and and, and just the fecundity of of the Smokies. And I thought, who is this guy? And the more I thought about it, the more I was remembering certain children who I had had special relationship with, as as I, you know, as I went from young adulthood into adulthood. Um, one niece and one nephew 
and also the son of a colleague of mine at the University where, of Illinois, where I had taught for many years. And I thought, what, what is it about these three kids? You know, why, what do they have in common? And at first I didn't see any commonality, commonality at all. And then I realized that the commonality was that each of them was incapable of bringing the, 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 the difference of their own personality into the fold that this society was asking them to. They were all struggling about the, the fact that they were traumatized by the, the world that they could not fit into. And it was through cultivating that those those three and making a little hybrid, changing the age a little bit, positioning Robin on that weird threshold between sweetness and, you know, bitterness, you know, that, that odd thing that happens as you go into pre-adolescence, you know, you're not a little kid anymore. Um, so what was interesting to me as far as Theo goes, is, is as I was working on Robin, I was thinking about these little kids and remembering my own strangeness as a child and suddenly realizing that I was actually, you know, the, the, the father taking care of my own strangeness without necessarily being attuned to or alert to the, 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 the oddness of myself, you know, that, that and, I, and I think that's, that's why I made it first person because in a, in a novel, there's this, paradoxical inversion of expectation. You know, when someone says, let me tell you about my friend Jay Gatsby, it's really about him. Mm. And when Theo says, let me tell you about the locked room that is my, that my young son, he's saying, I'm not going to go into my own past. And the reader has a sense of who this guy is that may be deeper than he himself has. And that's, that's, the, that's where you can leverage a first person performance, that they're revealing more about themselves and telling their story about someone else than they realize they're revealing. Oh, that's, that's so wonderful. Thank you, Rick, for that. Um, it's kind of amazing. I mean, I feel like I, it's funny. There, you don't know that there's a whole audience out there, but I feel like I could have a conversation with the two of you for the next couple of hours. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Share maybe with a little bottle of tequila or something as well. <laughs> but um, I just want to thank you both, and I I think you you know I think you might find it somewhat um, appropriately strange, and I certainly hope no one got hurt. But I got a news alert that in Melbourne, right outside of Melbourne, Australia, there was an earthquake tonight, a mm -hmm. 6.0 earthquake on the Richter scale. Mm -hmm. So. You know, your book is published and there are earthquakes happening. <laughs> so in any I don't case, think they're related. I don't think <laughs> I don't I don't think so either. <laughs> but in any case, thank you both so very much. And I want to thank all of my friends at Politics and Prose and Harvard for putting this on and the Miami Book Fair, of course. And I hope that we all get to see one another in the in the uh, non-virtual world before too long. The book is Bewilderment. And I thank you both. Thanks so much, Mitchell. Thanks, Elizabeth. And, and thanks to, to everyone involved in putting this on. Yeah, thanks to everyone. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Good night.